Thank you so much. And so now we will invite Richard to the stage, as well as the panelists. So please join us. And moderator Alyssa Trotz, who will uh, deal with these wayward people who we'll bring to the front here. Christopher, are you going to please come up? So wonderful, everyone is here, fantastic. Um, so first to my very left here, Alyssa Trotz, Director of Women and Gender Studies here at U of T, a Professor of Caribbean Studies as well, and representing Caribbean Studies this evening, who is also co-sponsoring this event. Then, oh, very much according to my piece of paper here, we have obviously Richard Fun, uh, who is our Barker Fairly Distinguished Visitor at University College this year. It's been wonderful having you uh, with us. He's also a Professor Emeritus in the Faculty of Art at OCAD University. Uh, then we have Christopher Laird. They all neatly arrange themselves, according to my piece of paper here, <laughs> who has produced over 300 documentaries with Bayon Limited. And in 2003, he co-founded the region's first all-Caribbean free-to-air TV station, Gael. He has received the Shaconia Medal Gold and an honorary doctorate from the University of the West Indies. He's the author of Equal to Mystery, a biography of Harold Sunny Ladu, which I believe is also out there for sale. And keeping to form here, we have Dr. Ramabai Espada, a writer and academic. She teaches in the Caribbean Studies program here at the University of Toronto. Her books include the novel, The Swinging Bridge and Nuclear Seasons, a collection of poetry. And at the very end, we have Andrew Gossin, professor of environmental arts and justice at York University, an author of Nature's Wild, Love, Sex, and Law in the Caribbean. He's currently based at the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, uh, Mass MA, Massachusetts. I always get those wrong. Uh, and the 2024 Brian Key Fellow. So thanks very much. Please take the away. Thank you. Oh, hi, is this okay? Okay, I wanted to just start by thanking a few people. Um, first of all, I want to thank Christopher for entrusting me with this huge archive, um, which must have been a bit nerve wracking for you. <laughs> um, I want to thank Andal who strongly encouraged me to make this film. I thought I was retired. We had a Zoom meeting and Ando said, I'll do anything you want. I will, I will help you in any way you can. So thanks Ando for pushing me to this. And Rabbi also, who has been um, someone who I uh, consulted through the entire process. I have to say, when I think of, when I look at Rabbi, actually Rabbi has been throughout my work. She was in My Mother's Place, which I made in 1990, and narrated Dalbri Diaspora in uh, 2012. Um, I also want to thank, of course, the Canada Council, who gave me the grant to make this, um, University College for inviting me to be here and agreeing to have this as my event for the Barker Fairley Caribbean Studies, um, with whom uh, I don't think I could have done this event. Um, also to Coach House for co-sponsoring and for bringing out yesterday's, you should all buy it. Um, um, there's another, <laughs> oh, and of course, another story. I can't read my crap over Brian. <laughs> another story outside who also agreed to sell the books. Um, the projectionist and VK, my distributor. There are people in the audience who are part of the film you recognize, David Chariandi, <laughs> um, award-winning novelist who's film of Brother, you should see if you haven't seen it, uh, by um, Clement Virgo. Uh, and I don't know, I saw some of the crew, who, or, or the people who were involved in the filmmaking, who said they might be here. Is Iris here? No. Carol Larson, the editor, is here. Who <laughs> really was very key in uh, putting it all together. Um, uh, Adam Williams, who did the amazing drawings for this film. I have to tell you a little bit of something about Adam. Um, 
I met Adam many years ago when we when I was at OCAD and we brought uh, artist uh, Christopher Cozier as a guest, and I discovered not only was Adam part of that group, but that we're related. Um, Adam is primarily a ceramic artist, but on his ceramics, he does these amazing drawings, and I knew I had to have somebody with a Trinidadian kind of sensibility to produce the drawings of this film. I, 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 anyway, it's a long story. Um, Gerald Bruzon, who is here. Oh, I think oh, they're all sitting together. <laughs> who did the sound recording, was wonderful to work with, also from OCAD. Um, is there, uh, Dennis, is Dennis Day here? Okay, okay. So is there anyone else who, <laughs> who worked on the film who I'm not, who I didn't see earlier? Okay, thank you, thanks for the film. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Thank you, um, Richard and Christopher, for this really haunting and moving and beautiful um, documentary, which, is not easy to watch. It goes to some very uncomfortable places, and you know, watching it again tonight and seeing it on the big screen was um, really crucial. I know it's late, but I know you all had doubles. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I said I know it's late, but I know you all had doubles, so you can stay and, and ask some questions. And I, I, I introduced. I thought it was I thought it was a Caribbean term, but it might be guys because I said to Ram them today. I'm not going to pamper that and ask four to questions. I'm just going to ask maybe one or two questions to each panelist and then I'd really like to open it up because there's so many of you here and I'm sure that you have things that you like to ask. So I'm, I'm going to just say a few words, ask some questions and then open it up to all of you. When, when Richard first sort of um, shared the uh, film, I think it was on Finished and was earlier this year and I was actually on my way to Trinidad because I was participating in Bocas and I was on the panel that was looking at creative nonfiction. And at the time, one of the books before us, which ended up being shortlisted, was Equal to Mystery by Christopher Laird. And the citation that we wrote, the others were Rachel Mordecai and Andre Bagu, um, noted, quote, that it offers, and this book is on sale outside in addition to um, Ladue's work, so please try to get a copy. I think you brought some. Um, it's absolutely beautiful, and I read it before I actually saw the film. And we said it is a stunning bricolage that weaves together elements of biography, memoir, critical analysis, and close textual reading in order to address an epistemological conundrum. Who was Harold Sonny Ledoux? What do we know or think we know of him, and what are the limits to that knowledge? Laird builds a complex portrait of an unquestionably brilliant author, but does this in a way that poses even more urgent questions about Ladoux's legacy. And what comes across in this film, one title could have been Ladoux the Lagahoo, <laughs> is that Ladu is really a lago who was shapeshifter, as we sort of see in this film. And we gather all of these deeply different glimpses across the film, from the conflicting memories of Peter Suck and Rachel, to the conflicting description of Erendale as a refuge, as a pastoral oasis, or as a fucking tumor. Um, of Harold as somebody who is shy or witty or confident, someone who could also be violent or not likable. And so I guess my, my first um, two questions are going to go to Chris. And, and, and Christopher, I mean, it's so striking that in so much of the film, we have, that, we have that theme that we see so much in the context of writers in diaspora of exile and of having to leave. And there's a point at which Harold is saying, you know, I might as well give up after the review and go back to Trinidad. And to think that this book and this work has sort of been inspired by you, someone who for all of us in the Caribbean is an example of someone who remained, um, someone who stayed in the Caribbean, you know, went to university, but all of your work, your creative work has, has, has been in the Caribbean. And so I wondered if you could reflect for us on two questions. The first is that the film talks about um, uh, positions uh, Ladu's work in relation to Pen Penlit. I'm wondering if you could share with the audience, like what was it when the book arrives in your hands in Trinidad? What is it about, about No Pain Like This Body at that moment of Caribbean literature in the Caribbean that is so compelling that you stay with that story for 50 years. That's the official one. The second question is a bit more personal because I feel like Ladu is like a family member to you. <laughs> and I wonder if you could share with us 
a bit up about what personally has it meant for you to live with this kind of for 50 years? Um, it's difficult to answer, and I have to be short because the night is long. Um, <laughs> in 1974, when the book arrived on my desk, we read it. I was editing along with Dr. Victor Cattell, who is, who is no longer with us. Um, we were editing an arts magazine uh, called Calgary. And uh, when we read this book, we were just blown over. Uh, you have to see the time. The time is the early 70s. It is just after the 1970 revolution in Trinidad, a, a, a sort of Black power originated uh, um, movement. And for young people, for the uh, disenfranchised black people who don't get work and that sort of thing, it, it was uh, it created a mutiny in, in the um, army. There were states of emergency, all that sort of thing. At that time, there was a whole movement to rediscover one's um, our traditions and reinterpret them in contemporary ways. This was being done in the music, it was being done in the poetry, a great explosion of oral poetry and so on. But in the novel, there was no sign of that until no pain like this body arrives on my desk. Speaking of a type of, it's, sh it's showing um, the East Indian community in a way that we had never seen before and which we suspected um, people veered away from in order not to, um, not to uh, upset the community. Um, this was seen to be such a viciously honor, uh, honest novel about what was happening in a family at a particular time in the history. And it was so audacious, so bold, so vicious, so moving, uh, so poetic, that it, we, it, we had never seen anything like this before. And I sort of thought, this is the, for the novel, for the Caribbean literature, this is a new move forward, the way that our music had changed, the way that our poetry had changed. And, and, um, and nobody seemed to take it on. <laughs> nobody knew about it. And I suppose then I so, sort of um, adopted uh, a sense of, I have to get Harold's, giving his, give Harold his rightful place in Caribbean literature. Here is something that's truly extraordinary. It's a, re, a, re in, a remaking of, of, of Caribbean literature in a new life, in a new way. And, and nobody's taking it on. Uh, and it's treated like a, you know, a one-off, it's a little thing, it's the only one novel. Uh, it's, you know, and it was just sort of pushed aside. A lot of people said, yes, it's very you know, impressive, but that was it. And I, unlike, co-editor didn't agree with that. And I suppose that's what has fueled ever since. My main concern, Harold had to take his place in Caribbean literature. And whatever I could do to bring him to the notice of the general public, then I would do it. And so we tried to make, well, you saw it in the film, tried to make a film, tried to make two films, uh, eventually, I, I said, look, I, I can't af afford to do this. I'm going to have to just write it. And I wrote the book because I didn't have to be you know, paying anyone to do that. Um, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> Richard, who I've known for many years. Thanks to Ramabai, actually. <laughs> he introduced us. And I have seen him. I've seen most, if not all, his films. And uh, he said, would you mind if I took on the project that you couldn't finish? <laughs> of course. I had sort of put it down. I had sort of lifetime regret one of those things. You say, oh, it didn't work out. So for me, I keep asking myself, why? 
I was, com you know, I had this sort of obsession with, with Ladu. The only thing I can think of is because I, I had this sense that an injustice had been done, a literary injustice. And as I say in the film, a whole new generation of writers have said that they, reading No Pain Like This Body told them they wanted to write, told them they could write. And, um, and it's inspired them. Three or four prize-winning novelists have said that. It took 50 years. I didn't believe it would take so long, but it did. So in the space of two years, between 2022 and today, you've had the publishing, publication of No Pain Like This Body in its eighth edition by Penguin, publication of his second novel, Yesterday's, for the first time a republication, first time in 50 years, the publication of the biography, and then to put a, a topping on the whole thing is Richard's film. You know, as a Trinidadian would say, I could dead now. <laughs> No, that's beautiful, this guy. This would soon be done. So, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of uh, no pain like this body's importance is Christopher's archive is enormous, and what you see here is like the tip of the iceberg of the, of the archive. And one of the stories that I couldn't put in was a very moving uh, interview with Javidi Hassan, who some of you might know is a very important um, a visual artist has won the Governor General's Award, and she goes to Trinidad on a residency that I actually had organized at the Canada Council. And I think she takes you back. She's the one that it kind of partly is involved with taking you back to the village or making you go back to the village with her. And to me, in the interview, talks about how uh, when No Pain Like This Body came out, she was working herself in kitchens and that the novel passed around to everybody who was working in the restaurant. As she said, from hand to hand. Hand to hand. That's such a fantastic image. This novel was passing hand to hand in, among people working in restaurants, waiters, dishwashers, and so on, because they were all of that age that they all wanted to be writers. And here was someone like them who had got one published. I could, I mean, the image is just stunning of, of this novel passing. While the critics sort of, ah! <laughs> a footnote, they were passing it from hand to hand. The, the other thing is that um, in the 2018 uh, Venice Biennale, um, Lani Maestro uh, represented the Philippines, and the Filipino pavilion was called No Pain Like This Body in honor of Harold of Sunday Night. So his, mm. his work actually has its resonance. That's beautiful. And I hope that maybe you might think about a, uh, some website or something that can actually host the archive for all of these other interviews that didn't make it into the film. I think that would be wonderful. Richard, I'm going to ask you two quick questions. You can see they're already not behaving, so we already <laughs> going to run out of time. But I'm going to ask Richard two quick questions. One is, Christopher called his book Equal to Mystery. You called it the enigma, which for all of us obviously invokes via Snipeball. And it's really interesting because, you know, the inaugural director, the person who made Caribbean studies possible at this university is the late Arnold Edwaru. So it was really wonderful to see him represented in the film. And he certainly addresses the way in which Ladu is uh, an unfaithful descendant of V.S. Naipaul. So I wondered if you could share with us where the decision to make the title Enigma came from. And then secondly, I wondered if you could share with the audience your, um, your um, sort of cinematic approach to telling this story in which life imitates art, imitates life, where you're moving between Harold's life, which is shape-shifting, and the novel in which, you know, I think it is, I think it is Christopher who talks about a certain kind of truth. You know, Toni Morrison says the difference isn't between fact and fiction, it's between fact and truth. And there's, there's truth in the in the novels, but in the telling of his life, there are all these slippages. And so I wondered if, 
if you could speak a bit to your um, your approach as a director to representing that. So two questions in making that. Um, well, first of all, the, the title, um, Christopher already taken mystery. <laughs> uh, Enigma with available, <laughs> the way of talking about, you know, my understanding of that. I never met him. Um, I came across the books, I was trying to remember, in the late 70s or early 80s, and they blew me away. Um, no Cain Like This Body is like a book that kind of sears it, like it, it, it stabs into your brain, and the poetry of it. As, as Shani says somewhere else in the, in the interview, um, you can't read this novel as a Trinidadian without reading it aloud. It just what you know, I've lost a lot of my Trinidadian accent, but it comes right back out. <laughs> you, just, you, know, you, you can't not read it aloud. So it, it, it was so gripping. Um, and I don't know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 that, that was it, in terms of the, the, the title. In terms of the, the um, uh, in terms of the approach, it really, I think with Carol and me, we kind of worked back and forth thinking how to tell this story, how to maintain the integrity of the story. You have to shave off a lot of the archive to, to create a kind of thread. And then Christopher's thread uh, throughout, and then uh, interweaving the, um, the bits of the novel long enough that you get a sense of the fiction, that the feel of it but also not too long that you get into it and then can't come back out of it. So there's all those kinds of negotiations that, that's uh, working in, in you know, editing, and I, I think uh, Carol and I really, um, it was a back and forth, and I've, uh, I've worked with Carol on a number of projects, including um, uh, a video called um, See in the Blood, which um, uh, I think had a kind of a, sophistication in the, in the editing approach and the structure that I have not felt I always have, have managed to maintain. Um, and so I really enjoyed working with Carol again. Thank you. Thank you. And for Angle and Rama, I'll just ask you more or less the same question and maybe we can open it up to the audience. And here I'm thinking about the reception of this work in, in um, diaspora, but not just in diaspora. And so, you know, in the film it's saying like, you know, Canada to that moment is, is the Caribbean is, is not present. And if the Caribbean is not present, Indo-Caribbeans are even more invisible. You know, Canada Jean Bopi talked about Naida Fish Not Fowl. In England, Stephen Bertebeck talks about Indo-Caribbeans as being misrecognized, miscategorized, misunderstood. It is not until 1996 that if you're Indo-Caribbean, you're even counted in the Canadian census because you're, if you're Caribbean, you were automatically assumed to be black until then. And so I wonder for both of you, if you can sort of um, reflect, and you say a bit about this in the film, with Andal and Rama, two questions um, for, for Andal. If you can reflect a bit on the significance of this work and what, what Ladu was doing then, here for you as someone who is writing not just the queer Caribbean, but as someone whose work in, in environmental studies is also around these questions of landscape. I mean, at the time when I was reading Chris's book, I was also in Trinidad reading Kevin Jarrett Hussein's Hungry Ghosts and kept thinking, oh my gosh, he is like a descendant of Ladu now, right? And so, but that's also your work. So I just wondered if you could speak to both the dimension of landscape, which comes up in the film, there's, there's a lot of that, and the sexuality. You know, and there's a queer sort of thread that goes through light and art as well. And then Rama, I wondered if you could reflect on, on that significance, because you would have been in Toronto at that time, what it was like at that time, and the significance of the work then. And then I wondered if maybe going to one of the less comfortable moments, if you would mind sharing with us what that experience as a Caribbean feminist writer and as someone who has really held down Caribbean, um, the teaching of Caribbean literature and Caribbean women's literature is this woman in New College, um, absolutely incredible. If you would share with us what that experience of interviewing Rachel was like. And then, y'all better come up here to questions, because I don't. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, um, I, uh, some of you will not recognize my voice, but it's me. So. <laughs> And I'll just continue. So um, at the time when I first read it, I would say I read it shortly after 
it came out. And uh, I've just recently written a piece which in a, a publication that Andrew edits, he's going to publish, where I said the same thing I'm saying now, which is when I first read it, I burst into tears immediately after reading it. And it was because of uh, the impact of Pa, uh, that man who really was, to me, the most alienated character, the most self-alienated and alienated altogether, that kind of character in West Indian fiction. I don't think there is a single character like that that I can think of who really has no empathy for anyone, and no one has any empathy for him. So here he stands, and I don't know why, but Pa just really, he, he just, he both broke my heart and he mashed it up at the same time because he is such a character. And I wondered, not having seen that character before, where did, where did Ladu get the strength to build a character like that? And then it happened again when I read the screenplay that you guys wrote. And I had the same reaction. I, it just, I was just overcome. And, and that screenplay was really a very beautiful screenplay. But shortly after I read it in 1972, there was an, something else that was happening at the time. Um, Back Images was a, 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 a publication that was just starting up, a small journal edited by uh, Rudy Murray, who was in Ryerson at the time. And I was involved in it together with my husband, um, Peter Espiné, who wrote the first review of, uh, of No Pain Like This Body that I've seen at any rate, uh, published shortly after it came out. And then coincidentally, I happened upon Faulkner at the same time as I lay dying. And then I understood where Lalu had got it from. And this was, in fact, um, Dennis Lee says that that in fact, um, Faulkner was uh, one of Ladu's mentors. But what Ladu does, it's what I think happened, and I'm imagining what happened as a writer, when he saw what Faulkner had done, unapologetically rendered the language of that community in the Appalachians without, without uh, in any way modifying it, simply using what it's, it's, I mean, we know that the language there, that there are pockets of language there that are close to Shakespearean English. So untouched has it been, you know, by, uh, by their isolation and so on. And what, what the character Anse does in that, as I lay dying, Anse is exactly like Pa. Anse, again, is a man unto himself, completely alienated from everyone alienated even perhaps from himself. And I realized that what, what was happening there is not so much that Ladu was patterning his, himself, uh, his, his work on these characters, as that he saw that it was possible to represent language in that way. He saw it was possible to represent the landscape for which he drew a map and in, both, in both publications. The map is important. And the map is so similar to Faulkner's map. So, you know, Faulkner's is essential to Ladu. And um, the, that's, that's um, you know, it really had a tremendous impact upon me. And then when I heard that Christopher was going to uh, make this film, I just, I just wanted it to happen so much that I got involved with it in many, many different ways. So um, I don't know if that's answered the first part. I can't, I can't remember now. <laughs> but the second part about the interview, um, well, it was the interview was a very unexpected thing for me because I was, uh, you know, helping Christopher in various ways, and and I was driving him up to Rachel's, and I was out you here um, to Rachel's place, and suddenly in the car. We were almost there. And he said, I hope you know that you are doing this interview. <laughs> and I said, 
are you crazy? How could you, you know, impossible? And he said, no, 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 I, you have to do it. I can't do it. So, I mean, I, I did it. <laughs> and I, I warmed to her right away. And um, she just chatted and chatted. And, and then I did, I, what happened, the, 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 um, the, the part where she breaks down, I was totally unexpected. It was totally unexpected for me. I did not know that that would happen. And um, I, I just, I felt that it was, I, I almost didn't know what to do, what or where to go with it. But, but Rachel, I, I knew that you wanted to talk. And perhaps it was, I don't know this, but perhaps it was at least one of the times that she spoke, maybe for the first time. I don't know, but she definitely wanted to do it. And so that's why we went ahead with it. And um, it was, uh, I mean, it, it was so harrowing. But I, I mean, I thought about it, I still think about it. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the picture that she gave was so graphic, standing in the snow that morning with a naked child and not knowing what else to do, but to say, I have to go to work. And I thought of all of the, the mothers and who, who have had to say this. And it was, it, it, it was, it was just overwhelming. It really was. But Rachel is a very strong woman. And I think um, in some way, she really, uh, although she, you know, she sort of positions herself as outside of the writing, she really understood what Harold was doing in some very deep way, she did. And when, oh, I, I had forgotten that she actually said that she read Vultures, and she knew that, uh, you know, I, I mean, one really has to wonder about what Harold was really doing. Harold was walking to his death. Rachel knew, he told so many people. He told um, Dennis, he told Peter, he, I mean, uh, I, I, and why, why was he doing this? And I wonder, uh, I still wonder about it. It's, it's a very haunting episode in Caribbean literature, in Caribbean fiction. And um, I, I don't think that uh, um, we'll ever get over Harold, or ever get over the fact that we have lost him long before he, he, he was able to do what I think he, he would have done would have done. So, um, okay, that's, that's my no, thank you. So I think very short answers to your very big questions really would do a disservice to how much uh, both texts offer in terms of thinking about sexuality and also relationship to, in, uh, to other beings in the landscape in both novels. But I will say that, you know, that uh, Richard, Christopher, and Ramabai have laid, have contributed so much to, to our field. And this is just sort of the latest, you know, piece that they've done and created in, in many foundations of work. And those questions are beginning to be answered and explored. So while this seems like maybe the end of 50 years, Christopher, things like the next issue of Essex Lawn, which includes like a review of your book, a wonderful essay by Ramabai, a, um, a short interview I did with Lonnie Maestro, um, some really terrific work. It's the beginning also of so much more work that will come, will come of it. So thank you all three of you so much for what you've contributed. I will say very briefly about yesterday's. Um, what appealed to me, because you know, it's, it's the lesser text. It's not the one that um, gets all of the attention, but for me, it's always the one I'm more excited about. And not just for the reasons that Ramabai um, put it in the film, you know, the, the humor, which I love, but because it gives us a complex idea of a Caribbean person and of the Caribbean. And looking through, I would, you know, one of the reasons I didn't, um, when I was teaching cultural theory and I was looking to look in corporate Caribbean work and I just couldn't do no pain in this body in an undergraduate class. <laughs> you know, it was just so abject, it was so hard. I, but if I discovered yesterday's, I would have rushed to do it. Because here was something 
that challenged people to think about the Caribbean in a way that was different from what they were expected to think about it. And it also, the reason that Harold's work, I think, uh, connects not just with other Caribbean people, this is not an Indo-Caribbean story, but these are stories about the human condition. And I think that's what's so beautifully done in yesterday's, is that we see people who are you know, terrible and funny and lovable all at once. And that's what I most value in his work. Open it up to questions. I think there's mics at the back or comments. Richard said I must put David Sherry on this slide. And it's funny because, so we're going to give you time to prepare. I was actually going to, after Rama spoke, thank, um, thank uh, Richard and um, and Chris for not shying away from these very difficult issues in the film. And I was gonna reference David because in the film you talk about this, this existential violence while at the same time there's also this repertoire of cultural resources to deal with it. And the way in which you describe Rachel I think um, perfectly speaks to both of those dimensions. So you have like two minutes to come up with a brilliant <laughs> question and live up to your name. And in the meantime, please introduce yourself before you speak. Hi, okay. Hello, my name is Vandana Maharaj. I'm a fourth year student at UTM, currently studying theater and drama studies. And also, I lived in Trinidad for 18 years of my life, and I just moved to Canada. So this has been an extremely impactful um, film and event and experience for me. So I have like maybe two comments and one question, which would be that one, thank you so much for making this um, and for telling this story because living in Trinidad my entire life, um, and I go back quite often to visit my family and so on, I look in every single bookstore for Caribbean literature and the sections are always this big in our own country. And when I saw um, another story bookshop outside, I raided it <laughs> and got like, almost every single book today. Um, because it's so hard to come across even when I'm back and forth from Trinidad and Canada all the time. Um, secondly, into, well, kind of to go off of that question, is there any way that um, Caribbean students or people in general in the diaspora, or even in Trinidad can have, is there any way to access this work that you've been doing? Is there any way that this would be made available like on streaming or to buy it or, or to like be shown somewhere? Because um, it was a very niche thing. I was emailed by my academic advisor about a past UTM um, graduate doing this film about UTM. And when I read the name as a Trinidadian piece, and I got so excited and thought, oh my God, this is about me, kind of. Um, but anyway, is there any way that this can be seen or um, done in a way that more people, because there are others like me who probably just don't know about it. Um, yeah. I'm actually in negotiation now with having a screening at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine um, in the winter and it will be connected to the Bocas Festival. Uh, we're just looking at dates of availability of the auditorium and stuff. The last film that I did um, that was Trinidadian was um, uh, Dark Queen Diaspora, which retraces the history of Indian migration through the evolution of West Indian roti. And that's been shown a lot on Trinidadian television. So I'm, I'm hopeful also that this will at some point make it to TV on the country and Tobago. Thank you so much. <laughs> While people are thinking about the question, I just want to point out for those people who might be thinking of reading any of these books, that the, the, the incredible thing about these two books, I mean, a lot of bad a lot of bad things are said about yesterday's, but I, I'm with Andil here. Um, what really is impressive is that 
you move from no pain like this body to yes it is. It, it, they are so diametrically opposite in style and in subject that I could, you know, it's unbelievable. When we saw that, it, we were filled with, um, with more admiration. Here is someone, instead of writing like a sequel to the first novel that was a success and what people expected, I think critics expected a sequel to Lope. Uh, he comes with something that's totally different. It's probably too much write what you know because I think for Trinidadians would experience it much better than um, a non-Trinidadian because of the language alone uh, and the jokes and the humor uh, would mean more to Trinidadian. So, you know, it was a bit of a, uh, a bold thing to do, if not foolish. Um, I put it, I, I, I remember saying, I think in the book, I say that it's like um, Tarantino suddenly decides to do a Mel Brooks film. <laughs> It's like that. It is so different. Uh, so those of you who are expecting or would like to think about reading the book, read them. They, they are they're short, so you don't have to spend too long. <laughs> uh, but they are so different and so interesting. Were you going to say something, Richard? No, no. OK. I, I, I simply want to, I do want to uh, congratulate you on a fantastic film uh, that um, for so many reasons, but also for the, um, uh, the truthfulness um, and the, um, the fearlessness with which you um, have explored uh, Harold Sandiladu. Um, so congratulations to that. Oh, can you, oh, yeah, there we go. Short, short thing, congratulations on, on such a, a supremely important film. I, I want to echo Andal's point, if I may, I, I think such an important point that, um, um, you know, um, conversations about Caribbean literature uh, have been made possible because of the work of, uh, you know, generations of critics, writers, um, run by you taught me, uh, gave me my first systematic introduction to the study of Caribbean literature. You and Frank, who's also in the film, I want to thank you for that. Thank you for the work, um, um, being a custodian of cultural memory and caring for the legacy of Harold Sonimadu. I have nothing more to say except this. Um, I shared the feeling that you expressed um, Ramabai in reading uh, No Pain Like This Body. I was, uh, it was a deep emotional reaction. And then afterwards, uh, such a, I was enthralled form of it by the form of the book, by the language of the book. Um, ultimately a deep emotional reaction. I had the same reaction, this is my first time watching the film, um, watching the film and hearing things about Harold Sanibadu that I had not heard before. And um, I cannot reconcile those things right now, but I, I just want to put that out there, that um, it, is, it is jarring and it is difficult to reconcile uh, the two narratives about Sarah, Harold Sanibadu that, I've, um, that I've, I now can't be as well spoken as the previous people here, so I so, just want to speak on that you have of our son's family. And uh, when you brought up the address, um, that's where my wife, Sita, uh, my sister-in-law, Judy, actually lived at that address with his son, uncle. And uh, I mean, son. And, and then another relative as well as Tony Singh here as well. So we just want to thank you uh, so much. Um, that literature was in our house. Uh, 
since the time I met my wife, 40 years ago. And uh, it's, um, it's something that's a big one. Thank you so much for uh, keeping his legacy alive. And some of the things that may or may not agree with you, but this all film, but um, no, but the, uh, he was just a, we heard so much about a fun loving guy um, when he lived, when they lived with him for how long was he there? Off and on for a long time. So, anyways, well, thank you so much uh, for all of you. Uh, I think we had to, to go through. I only knew the novels. So when I saw the archives, the interviews, when I, I, I approached Christopher, actually what happened is, Christopher was coming to Toronto to do the interview. He came to dinner, and then eventually, like two or three years ago, I, I emailed him and said, Christopher, what happened to that documentary? <laughs> Where is it, when is it gonna show? And he said, oh, I'm abandoned it. Oh. So that's when I, got into this conversation that led to the making of the film. I had seen nothing of the archives, so I knew nothing about the more complicated, I knew nothing of the backstory, either of the novels or the publication or anything. So I'm seeing the, the archive with fresh eyes. I think what we had to do was to, for me, it was important not to create answers, which is why I use the title Enigma. I didn't feel, I, I knew the truth, if there is a capital T, because what is clear, when I'm looking at the interviews, is that in terms of the, you know, there are different personalities depending on whom you speak with, right? So there's a family story, the different versions of the family stories of his relatives from Rachel and uh, Jeffrey, and then there are the white Canadian, um, you know, literary establishment for whom he was this other character, this very jovial um, character. So I could never tell the truth about Harold. So it really is just being able to, um, in as short a time as possible, um, convey the complexity of the archive. That would, I think that was my task, that's how I saw it. And somehow keep the audience interested. <laughs> as well as the complexity of the archive, including the beauty of the novels. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it was very shortly mentioned regarding, regarding their marriage that there was a tradition of marriages within the family, marrying a family member. So um, what um, uh, uh, cultural, uh, whose um, tradition is that? What exactly ethnicity of the people were there? That, uh, and can you explain more as to um, this um, regarding marrying family members, yeah. I'm gonna give that one to Rabbi. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is one of the Harold's tall tales, definitely. I mean, it, there is a, there's no such tradition in Trinidad that I know of like that. However, you know, there is something in uh, 
Muslim families that I've heard of, that you know there is some sort of protector kind of, uh, if, if, if the husband dies, there is a protector relationship that is uh, often that often passes to um, another uh, male member of the family. However, that is not something that came alive in in, in Trinidad. But uh, he was Hindu, right? Not a Muslim. He was not in any way. As I said, it was one of his tall tales. And he had many, many different narratives of uh, um, you know, how, he, how he became Harold. Like the orphanage is another one. Um, so that business. And, and we know from Rachel that there's certainly another story. You know, that it was not in fact that he had to take charge of her. So I think that that's something that you take with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Crystal Tomlin-Wong. Um, I'm a PhD student studying Caribbean literature uh, here at U of T. Um, I hadn't heard of Radio before tonight, and so I haven't read any of his works. Um, but what really um, stood out to me was the kind of sensory dimension um, of his writing and how it was translated into the film, so the thunder and the Yes, all of that. So I was just curious about um, whether that's something that carries through in his writing, the, the sensory details, especially relating to the environment and the body, um, and how um, for uh, from how you included those details or how you chose to include those details um, in the stories or the glimpses of the stories that you looped into the documentary. I asked each of the writers that I invited to participate in the film to actually choose sections that spoke to them. And then what I tried to do was to arrange those chronologically in the film so that it made sense, right? But in terms of looking like this body, not much actually happens in terms of if you think of a, lar a long plot arc. It all happens in a very condensed period. And in fact, there's not a lot of shift. It doesn't have the arc of like a big release or anything, right? It, it, it starts dark and it stays dark and it gets darker. What you hear at the end of the film, at the end of the film is actually the end of the novel. You know, rain falling on their heads from heaven. That is actually the last line. And we start with the opening line. But that was also partly um, by chance because I think whoever chose to, uh, to, to those sections of the novel chose those sections. I mean, I just want to add like one little thing, which is it's really important that this, these stories are taking place in rural villages. Yeah. You know, we don't often get those stories to print because those are not the folks getting the best educations. No, not, those are not always the folks who get to have space to say things. But there's so much there that's unexplored, and so. Part of the viscerality of the kind of environment that we feel in the literature and, the, and we see Richard translate in the film is just that. It's just that he's writing about being in this space in which one's proximity to, to plants, one's engagement with you know this 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 dynamic of being both uh, uh, fearful of and also dependent on and joyful with other forms of life has to run through all of it because that's just what's happening in those spaces. Like that, that complicated ecology of those places comes forward. Um, and I think Richard um, and, and true Adam's uh, gra graphic design has done a really good job of emphasizing that. Can I just add one thing? That the, the animation was incredible. And I think what the animation picked up was the emotional texture of, of, of the, the whole work. And that's what, that was so just brilliant. I really loved it. And also the way that onomatopoeia was rendered as well. You know, the, um, almost like animation. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to just invite um, Christopher and Richard perhaps to offer two closing comments so that we can bring this wonderful well, um, I have too many things to say, um, especially about Richard Stern. 
Uh, one question that was not asked me was, what did you feel about Richard taking your footage? <laughs> Richard and I actually met upstairs uh, just before the film ended and we were going to ask that, we were going to ask, what was the, the question we were going to ask? Well, I'm going to what say now, I'm going to say now in front of Richard, what I tell everyone who asked me that question. It is obviously an obvious question. Um, as I said, I've known Richard, I've seen his films. Uh, when Richard offered to do this, I was totally confident that the film would be respect the, the archive, what Richard calls it, they would be respected. I was very concerned about the participants of these interviews that I did 20 years ago. Uh, I got them to sign releases uh, about a film that never happened, and then get turned into a release for a book that did happen. So I'm very good, I, was, I would not have handed just to anyone. When Richard said, I didn't have second thoughts. Richard has a, a, an innate curiosity about people and how they work in the world, how they inter, interface with the world, what they try to do with their lives in the world. And I knew he would respect these interviews and these people, and he did. And not only that, he put together a mishmash of clips and thoughts and everything in a very good flow of stuff. We never feel the almost 90 minutes of this film. It runs, it goes, and he captured all the main points that I thought he should capture. And uh, he, had, he does it with his usual um, sort of gentle uh, but insistent curiosity and uh, his, his aesthetic sense, of course, makes it his film. I knew I wouldn't see my film. I knew I would see a Richard Fung film, and I was perfectly happy with that. And, what's, and yes, maybe I was a bit anxious while it was going on and he would send me pieces and so on. But I had confidence. This man knows what he's doing. He is a human being. He understands humans. And that's what this film is about. Um, what's more, it, you could not, um, in answer to the first question you asked me, this story is incredible. Where can you get a story like that? It is absolute shame if you don't do something with that story. A man leaves a village in a little island in the Caribbean, and in three years, he writes two novels, gets a degree, writes about half a dozen short stories, which are perfectly respectable, and in, in just that time. And then he gets killed. Hmm. And then you hope that maybe he has a treasure trove of unfinished novels that we're going to discover and that we can bring to light, which of course doesn't happen. But what a story. Just regardless of who Ladu is and how good a writer he is, the story alone is, has to be followed. And uh, to close, uh, the, the title of my book, as Richard says, Equal to Mystery is a direct quote from Harold. Harold wrote in one of his stories that uh, a man has to die violently to become equal to mystery. Mm -hmm. I leave that with you. Mm. <laughs> well, I'll be very short. I mean, um, the film, uh, it really builds on Kandei Christopher's um, archive and the interviews um, were so like they're so perfectly done and you ask all the right questions you get all the material down so it was not hard work working with the raw material that I had from Christopher so that's it thank you and thanks to everyone I want to um, <laughs> thank you all I want to thank the family especially for being here with us tonight Thank you.
this incredible panel. It is an honor to be with you. And I am so proud to be in Caribbean Studies, can I just say. Um, Harold Sonny Ledoux, you know, lived a short life, but did so much, died so suddenly, so violently, and you feel that restlessness. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's a presence here. What you have done, we haven't used the word love, Christopher, but this was love. This was a 50 year journey of love that Richard has now brought to the screen, and I wanna thank you all for being part of us here for this period. <laughs> Send this to your uh, honor. I'll send you this. I heard you ask.